2 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 through 14, from the New Living Translation. This boasting will no, do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was caught up in the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside of my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me the credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep from me from being proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from being or becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and the insults and hardships and persecution and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You have made me act like a fool. You ought to be writing commendations for me, for I am not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing at all. When I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I am an apostle, for I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. The only thing I failed to do, which I do in other churches, was to become a financial burden to you. Please forgive me for this. Now I'm coming to you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you. I don't want you to have want what you have. I want you. This is the word of God for the people of God. I don't think anybody here would disagree Paul is an exceptional person in many ways. He was part of the Jewish aristocracy, an educated man, a Pharisee, a man of the world. He stood out from the crowd because of his outstanding oratorical skills. People paid attention when he talked. And at times he pointed out his own greatness as we see in scripture just that I just read. In this first couple of verses of chapter 12, Paul is telling us what, it ma what, it, what makes him exceptional. He mentions being caught up in the third heaven where God dwells. He speaks about experiencing paradise there. This special experience sets him apart from others. He also makes sure that they know he is an apostle with credentials having work signs and wonders. And we might take from this that the idea that he tells them this so they will respect and admire him would be okay, or maybe see him as a celebrity, someone who really is extraordinary and special, not ordinary like them. We don't have any problem with Paul pointing out his greatness because, let's face it, we live in a culture and a time when exceptionalism is highly valued. Let's face it, extraordinary people are given more credibility and value in our society. We talk about famous people in our lives, we, people we've met or have associated with because we want to be thought of as being exceptional in some way and it connects us to exceptionalism. Some of us have exceptional qualities that we often remind others of. 
And if we're not exceptional, we sometimes point out how someone we know is even less exceptional. In today's world, being exceptional means that you have value. Being ordinary, not so much. Every state has its way of being exceptional. We think of Utah, the greatest snow on earth. Texas, the Lone Star State. Wyoming, equal rights. Exceptionality. We raise our kids to be exceptional in some way and brag about their uniqueness to others. It has a way of raising our value in our own eyes when we are exceptional. I myself am a product of American exceptionalism. My dad wanted to be exceptional in his career, was known as an outstanding civil engineer with brilliant ideas. I grew up believing that there was something exceptional about me. I'm named after one of the two climbers to summit the West Ridge of Mount Everest, the first climbers to summit the West Ridge. Tom Hornbein and my dad were climbing buddies in college in Boulder and climbing guides in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Dad named me after Tom and he named his son after my dad. It made me feel vicariously famous. And some of you don't know that my first name is Thomas, my middle name is Robin. As I look back for much of my life, I was driven by a desire to be exceptional. I completed a PhD, taught at the university, wrote a book, produced documentaries, maybe in part out of a creative impulse and maybe in part to seek exceptionalism. But let's look further now into what Paul is saying about himself. He argues that he is exceptional to establish his authority as a Christian or a believing leader. As we read on, Paul is telling us something very important about how he views his own exceptionalism and how we should view ours. In verses 5 through 10, Paul makes an about face and opens his heart to those who are listening. He begins to talk about his own weaknesses in a way that makes us turn from looking at his celebrity status and greatness to his humanity, his weakness, and his struggles, his frailty. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh here refers to, most often, we think of it as a physical disability or problem. But I think he's referring in this verse to something else. Maybe it's an addiction or a behavioral flaw that Paul cannot willfully remove on his own. We recall in Romans, in chapter 7, he admits he has a behavioral problem in saying, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. We see here a powerful example of someone who was exceptional becoming average in his confession of the thorn in the flesh. By making himself vulnerable, Paul is coming down from the pedestal everyone has put him on to their level. As a result, we no longer see him through celebrity, but as someone we can relate to. It turns out that Paul is an ordinary person with problems, just like us. You all know Tiger Woods, the name Tiger Woods, the greatest golfer to ever walk a golf course. For sports television, it was as if he was a god. Maybe still is. Then one Thanksgiving night, that all changed. His life as a philandering sex addict blew up the image of the invincible star. He became human like us. His celebrity status was shattered at least for the moment. We suddenly saw Tiger Woods as weak and vulnerable, 
an ordinary human being. Here Paul is admitting weakness in a declaration of his real need for Christ. He tells us very bluntly in verse 7 that he was given this affliction or torment to keep him from becoming proud. And then he shares a powerful statement in verse 8. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. End of the scripture reading. When he was in his greatness, Paul was unable to see clearly. He was self-reliant, he was strong. Uniqueness and notoriety led him to believe that he really was extraordinary. But the Lord brought him to his knees so that he could know where his greatness came from. When he wanted to take credit, God reminded Paul through his thorn. It produced suffering, an important part of spiritual development. You could think of suffering as an incubator for the spirit. It produces vulnerability. And when we're vulnerable, we are capable of change. As a result of his hardship and suffering, Paul could now be useful to God. The paradox is plain for us to see. We think of strength is made perfect in weakness. I had the opportunity to visit Tom Hornbein when we vacationed in Colorado six years ago. I was excited to see my dad's climbing partner and friend. I was nervous and self-conscious because this is a famous man. When we drove up to their home in Estes Park, Tom and Kathy's home in Estes Park, I was starstruck. Here in front of me was this great mountain climber and academic from the University of Washington. I was at a loss for words. But as we shared family life and history, I began to relax. He put me at ease with his gentle and pleasant manner. He showed interest in me and my wife. He shared personal stories about his life and some about his own struggles. I was surprised. How could a man who climbed the west ridge of Mount Everest have any troubles? The facade came down and I got to know Tom Hornbein, the person who, like all of us, has challenges. He turned out to be very unlike the image I had created of him in my head. Here was a kind and humble person who had a deep sense of caring for those in his life. There was something extraordinary about his ordinariness that made me admire him. It's a sense of a common bond in the shared human struggle and journey. I was empowered by this experience to recognize that it's not what sets us apart that matters, but what we all have in common. When we let ourselves be known, God brings grace into action and wonderful things happen. When we let ourselves be known. I remember when I was at the University of Cincinnati, our department gave an award annually to a distinguished alumnus one year, the award went to Earl Hamner. The name may not sound familiar until I mention his works. He created the TV show, The Waltons, and did a film adaptation of Charlotte's Web. He was a prolific screenwriter and had many works to his credit. Falcon Crest was another of his works. When Hamner came to campus, I had the privilege of having him visit my classes, two of my classes, where he shared with students his thoughts and ideas. And I remember being very excited about meeting this accomplished author 
and writer and hearing about his work and his life, gleaning ideas. When we sat down to talk about his visit, coming visit to my classes in my office, I was nervous to be in the presence of such a famous man. But as we talked, Earl shifted the attention to me and asked about my life and my work. And when he visited my classes, he affirmed me in the value of my work as a teacher and the importance of what I was doing. He was the most down-to-earth, kind, and ordinary sort of a person. I would never imagine, have imagined that because I was looking at him through the lens of exceptionalism and fame. But he was looking at me through a lens of humility and commonness. It didn't matter that I was a not-so-famous college professor. These two individuals didn't act as if they were special and didn't necessarily see themselves as exceptional. They just happened to end up being famous for what they did. The achievement and public recognition came as a sort of as a byproduct of living their lives intentionally as ordinary people. They understood that fame and notoriety are artificial labels that can keep one from being able to connect with people. In our technological society today, we're fed a steady stream of exceptional and ordinary messages and images. I'm sure you've got texts or emails with something amazing, some goofy trick that a dog did or amazing feat that an athlete did, a golf trick or something. We have the voice on television, you've got talent, dancing with the stars, Facebook friends who look so much happier than we do. Super athletes performing amazing feats that boggle the imagination. So in this world of exceptionalism and extraordinary images, we start to compare our lives to theirs and begin to believe that if we're not exceptional, our lives don't have value or we don't matter. But in today's scripture, Paul shows that this is simply not true. He says, I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Let's reflect on how this scripture relates to our lives. What is the thorn in your flesh? What struggles, what struggle have you been trying to get God to take away? And how do you relate to Paul when he says, I do what I don't want and don't do what I should? Paul shows us that it is not what makes you and I exceptional that matters. It's what connects us. And we reach one another through vulnerability and weakness not invincibility and strength. Through our common weaknesses and vulnerability, we, like Paul, become dependent on God and show God's strength through our weakness. So my hope for you in this age of exceptionalism and superlatives is to evaluate yourself not in terms of how you are unique or exceptional so that you can feel better about yourself. Instead, let yourself be ordinary and common, even unexceptional. It takes a lot of pressure off, I'll tell you that. In doing so, you can then accept the weakness the suffering that leads you to the feet of our Lord and let yourself experience his grace. In that place of humility, we become a witness to God's love and strength to others. Amen.